Welcome to our interview series, We Choose to Thrive, brought to you by Becky Norwood of The Woman I Love. We bring you stories of survivors who have chosen to heal, to thrive. If you are an abuse survivor and are starting or continuing your healing journey, these stories will provide hope, inspiration, and a knowingness that you are not alone. Join us in today's interview. Well, welcome, Michelle, to our We Choose to Thrive series. We're so happy that you have decided to join us. There are many of us that are, are beginning to put our voices together to speak in unison about the effects of, of what abuse has done on our lives, but more so to show that we can thrive and to heal. Tell us a little bit about your story, what got you to the place that you are today, what you're doing with your life, but just the initial, what happened to you in your early life? And we'll talk about the transformations that occurred. Okay, well, thank you so much, Becky Norwood. My name is Michelle Croswell. I am a native New Yorker. I was raised in Brooklyn, but in the Park Slope area. And unfortunately, in my younger years, approximately at the age of two, my paternal grandfather did some things, to say the least, that was inappropriate to me. I, I wouldn't have known that at that time because, again, I was two years old. We had a terminology, the family used a terminology called the pippy um, to describe the male and female organs. So, and that's the terminology I'll use. Here. I remember him having a long hallway and there was a back room and it smelled like mothballs. So that, that is a trigger for me, the smell of mothballs or enclosed areas. And he used to fondle me in that area, in my vaginal area. I don't ever remember being penetrated but I know he used to follow me and used to tell me that I'm his big girl. So that was the start. As time went by, I was special. I was my big daddy's special little girl because of that factor. Uh, around the age of three, my brother's father, I say my brother's father because I don't know if he is my biological father at this point. Both parents are deceased. But I'm making the assumption that he is. I was sitting on his lap and I was gyrating. And I'm assuming that's because of what I was taught by Big Daddy. And in the gyrations, my father got an erection. And, and this is something he told me years later. Because I was gyrating, he then got an erection. He then took me into the bedroom. Um, no one else was home. And he began to do things that a grown man would do to a grown woman, that being penetration and cunnilingus. And over a period of about 10 years, that continued. So I actually was taught at a young age, from the ages of two to 13, that sex was love. And that's what I equated it to be. Especially coming from a part of figures, someone that I respected, that I loved, that I, I looked up to. A daughter or granddaughter's first loves are their father or their grandfathers. You know, so these two people that I loved the most were teaching me things that were so inappropriate, but I did not know at that time. So what happened at 13 that changed this for you? You go to the tweens. In school, you learn about sex and things that's right. You learn about what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate to do. I was a tomboy. And being a tomboy, I didn't like boys like boys because I think because of what was taught to me by my grandfather, who was now deceased. I might have been four years old when he expired. I knew I couldn't have a boyfriend. And if I did, it would be a problem especially the age of 13. I just felt I knew something was not correct. And because every time my mother would leave the home or my brothers wasn't there, and just the look he would give me, I knew it was time for him to do what he wanted to do with me. And it really got to a point where I would fight him. He was also an alcoholic. He was a functional alcoholic. He was a postal worker. We were a middle-class family. It wasn't like we were poor. We were middle-class. In our community, the families raised each other's children. There was a lot going on. You know, since it takes a community to raise a child, so there's a lot going on as far as people looking out for us. But unfortunately, behind closed doors, we were very dysfunctional. It was a very dysfunctional family. Many families are. So as you progressed along, what were the things that you did to start on your healing process and to make a stand for yourself? When I reflect back, the things I did in my life, if I could take back, I would. I was a runaway at 13. I ran away because I didn't want that abuse anymore. I ran away and was on a bus and 
crying profusely on this bus because I, I was leaving everything and everyone I knew behind that I loved, you know. But I had to leave. My baby brother was my heart. I raised him. And I knew he wouldn't understand. I had to leave him. So um, when I ran away, unfortunately, getting on that bus and crying and thinking I'm doing the right thing, had no idea where I was going. I met this man who befriended me and told I, I told him my story and he said he could help me. That same night, I followed him like a little puppy dog. This is, I'll never forget, follow him like a little puppy dog because I had nowhere to go. I didn't know where I was going. And unfortunately, he tried to molest me. But by the grace of God, I survived. I was able to, to escape his grips and I slept under a truck that night. And that was the beginning. And so for 13 to 16, I was a runaway, but the blessings was that I had friends and family that put me up, well, friends, they put me up and I was able to go to school. Now you asked a very valid question, what changed? Though, during those 10 years that I was being sexually molested, unfortunately I got vaginal infections and I had to lie because he would tell me if anybody ever found out that somebody would get hurt, I didn't want that. I had to lie. I had to not tell the truth. When my mother found out I had this vaginal infection, she would say, well, what boy do you messing around with? What, what are you doing? I wasn't messing around at the time with no one other than this gentleman that was molesting me. But I couldn't tell her that because that same man, there was a lot of domestic violence in the household. He would beat her whenever he could or she gunfights and she, it was all kind of craziness in the house. I had to protect my family and I had to hold that secret. That family secret had to stay with me no matter what. Because if I told someone would get hurt in my family and I couldn't bear that thought. But at the same time, when I ran away, I was so concerned about what's going to happen to my baby brother. What's going to happen to my big brother? I had two brothers. The thoughts just crossed my mind and I just said, I have to protect me. So where are you now? Um, what are you doing now in your life? How did you begin to heal? Where are you in your healing process at this time? And that's an excellent question. In all the jobs that I've worked, I've always worked helping people. I was law enforcement for over 20 plus years. In my law enforcement, I could never divulge that I was sexually molested. Because of how society is, it, I would have been labeled. And that's the problem that I'm fighting to advocate against, that label. That this is statistically, if you are a child of someone who's been molested, statistically, you become someone that molests others. And that is not true. That is not statistically true. And, and I hear that so often as, as an advocate. I say, that's something, stop the labeling. You have to stop the labeling. During my 20s, 30s, and 40s, um, I just turned 59 last week. I was very promiscuous. And I realize now a lot of promis promiscuity was taught to me. And I never went for help. I never went for help what had happened to me. I held that in for many, many decades. That's very common. Sorry, Becky. Very common. The, the healing process started for me when I went to my undergraduate degree and the professor had stated we needed to do a short bio about our lives. You know, I really didn't want to do it, but I, okay, I did it. It was a 15 page bio, which included some of what I just mentioned. And, and I thought it would only be something he would read for his eyes only. So after reading it, he said to me, you know, this is something that you need to finish this as a book. You need to write your story. Because in your story, you will be helping many others that can identify and relate to what's happening or what has happened to you. So I told him, I said, I really didn't write this for anybody else to read other than you. I, I, I'm not ready to do that. Right. You know, so I wasn't ready at the time. Through Oprah coming out, when she came out, it helped me to get a little stronger, to build up enough nerve with Oprah. And then there were so, uh, so many other celebrities that were coming out. And again, because I was a police officer at that time, I knew I couldn't divulge what happened to me. Because I was labeled. I would be labeled. And I, I, I wanted to be in life a normal working person, not being labeled for what had happened to me in my past, but to deal with me as the person that I am in, in my now, who I am, who I have developed to be. And I didn't want people to relate to me as, oh, she was sexually abused. I, at that time, no. It took me time to realize and recognize it's time for the healing. So in 2002, when I wrote that book and, he, and the professor mentioned that to me, it took me about another two years before I said, you know what? I wrote this 15 pages. I need to go ahead and start processing this in the book. And I did. Just the process of writing this book 
was the true healing because I cried every every word that I put in that book. I cried just to have to go back and remember remember what I had to go through. Those memories brought me to a point of yeah, it was a healing process I needed to go through. I just published my first book two weeks ago. It was telling my story, and it was the best healing that I've ever had. Yes. In the process, we write a new story for ourselves. We put that off to the world, and we are able to create a new story for us to, to, to live and grow by. Absolutely, absolutely. And since the writing of that book, I've been in law enforcement. I advocate, I'm an advocate for children. I've counseled with youth especially children who have been abused. I was investigating for the state of Florida for children of abused and adults that have been abused, foster parenting, just loving, helping people. But at the same time, I think that is my calling. That's something that I, I as I mentioned to you, I think about RAIN, Rape, Abuse, Incest, National Network. Right. Uh, I became an uh, online counselor with them over, I think now about 10 years ago. I haven't been with them for several years now, but I stayed with Rain for about four years, and I became a public speaker for them as well. They would speak out against abuse. Then from there, so many other things I've encountered and have happened since those years have passed, and just the healing process and me being involved in different things in the communities. I'm just a totally different person, you know. Was there any particular book that you read that really struck you? Was there counseling that you got? I think it was a lot of the brochures. I think it was the program and what I learned from Rain that helped me through because they had so many different resource information. Me being able to speak to others that would call in at that time and they were going through and to identify with them so I can relate, I understand, and give them some resources to help them. That was helpful for me as well. And then there were support groups online that I was part of for a little while. The counseling, I, I think I went to one counseling session and I said, I don't see why I need to pay a hundred and something dollars per hour to a counselor that I can go and get just the support groups would work for me for. So what words of wisdom would you share with somebody that's just starting down this journey of healing and becoming the, the woman that they loved? What words of advice would you share with them? First, identify with yourself that you were never at fault. You are never the one to blame yourself. Lose that. Get rid of that because we tend to fault ourselves for what happened to us. And that is, once you release that, that will allow a lot of other positive things to come into your life. Talk to others that you have, you can entrust yourself with about your situation. We feel that we shouldn't talk to people because of the things that happened to us. But in that talking, that's a release factor. That's a healing process, you know. And crying, it's okay to cry. You're gonna have triggers. There's going to be some scent, some smell, something in your life that's going to remind you of that traumatic time. Walk, go through it. Go through it because that's part of that healing. And once you come out, you'll see you're fine. You're in a new place now. You're safe. Right. You're no longer in that period. Very good. Well, I thank you for taking the time to do this interview with us. I so appreciate it. This story was brought to you by The Woman I Love at www.thewomanilove.com. If you are starting down the path to healing, no matter what stage, our united message is that you are not alone. We do not want to live with a victim mentality. We choose to thrive, and as such, we are joining hands to spread the message that you too can heal and thrive. Will you join us as a force of change we need in our world? Only by healing, growing strong and uniting, can we create the awareness of this terrible epidemic that is plaguing our world. We heal in many different ways. There is no one right way to heal. But the right thing to do is to heal. Heal for yourself, for your families, and for our world. Will you join us in this we choose to thrive revolution reach out to us at www.thewomanilove.com also check out the incredible resources at www.rainn.org and if you are actively facing abuse in this moment do not delay 
Seek out help in your local community immediately. Here is to your wellness, healing, and thriving.